is Mr. Desmond Mead. Ms. Johnson. Thank you for this opportunity. Mr. Desmond Mead was born July the 22nd, 1967, is a voting rights activist and the president of the Florida Rights Restoration Co Coalition, chair of Fl Floridians for a Fair Democracy, and a graduate of Florida International University College of Law, a Ford Global Fellow, and a 2021 MacArthur Genius Fellow. Recognized by Time Magazine as one of the 100 most influential people in the world for 2019, Mr. Mead presently leads efforts to empower and civically re-engage local communities across the state and to reshape local, state, and national criminal justice policies. His work has resulted in being named Floridian and Central Floridian of the Year 2019. As president and executive director of the Florida Rights Restoration Coalition, which is recognized for his work on voting and criminal justice re reform issues, Mr. Mead has led the Florida Rights Restoration Racial Coalition to a historic victory in 2018 with the successful passage of Amendment 4, a grassroots citizens initiative which restored voting rights to over 1.4 million Floridians with past felony convictions. Amendment 4 represented the single largest expansion of voting rights in the United States in half a century and brought an end to 150 years of a Jim Crow era law in Florida. Desmond Mead has made numerous appearances on radio and television station and has received numerous recognition. He is the author of Let My People Vote, My Battle to Restore the Civil Rights of Returning Citizens and America's Disenfranchised, Why Restoring Their Vote Can Save the Soul of Our Democracy. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Mr. Desmond Mead. I was fully expecting her to give my full government name. <laughs> I mean, she put my birthday in there and everything. See, I know how old I am. <laughs> well, good evening, everyone. Um, I am definitely honored to be here at the Edward Waters University. Uh, have a very rich history of engaging with this um, institution of higher learning. And that history have all been pleasant. Um, July 22nd, you, you forgot to tell them that I'm a Cancer and a Leo. Yeah. You put that in, <laughs> you put that in there. But two words, uh, who and why. I, I want you all to help me remember those two words, who and why. I wonder what, want to really start with who, who am I? You know, and when people ask me who I am, sometimes I typically start in August of, of 2005. And it was a hot and humid day back then. And I used to tell folks that it was so hot and humid, you know, that I actually seen a dog chasing a cat and they were both walking. Y'all know how hot and humid that is, right? But for a few moments, I was actually able to block out that oppressive heat and humidity because I was standing in front of railroad tracks waiting on a train to come so I can jump in front of it. And what was going through my mind was how much of a disappointment I was to my family, right? And I didn't see like any kind of light at the end of the tunnel. That moment that I stood there, I was, I was a broken man. I was homeless, I was addicted to drugs, mainly crack cocaine, I was unemployed. I was recently released from prison, right? I didn't, you know, matter of fact, the only thing I owned were the clothes that was on my back. And I didn't see any reason to go on with life. And so I, I stood there in front of those tracks and I'm thinking, right, how much pain I was gonna have to go through when that train ran over my body. Whether I was gonna die instantly or whether I had to endure moments of agonizing pain. 
Now, I'm going to tell y'all, I'm, you know, I'm a big guy, but I'm still a wimp. I'm scared of needles. I hate pain, right? But even though I hate needles and pain, the thought of the pain that I may have to in, endure when that train ran over my body was not enough to make me move. And I stood there and I waited. And I waited. And I waited. I was tired, y'all. I was just tired of that vicious cycle of, of being addicted to drugs. I was tired of, of being a, dis, a disappointment. I was tired of, of getting arrested. I was tired of not having anything. I was tired of, if I did get something, I'll end up losing it. I was just plain out tired and I wanted to end my life. But by the grace of God, that train didn't come and I ended up crossing those tracks. And I walked a couple blocks further myself into a uh, substance abuse treatment facility. And while there, some things happened that actually helped change my perspective in life. And after completing uh, treatment, I ended up moving into a homeless shelter. And while there, I decided to go to school. Now, let me tell you, I didn't have any grand plans when I decided that, right? Because my thinking was, I was just trying to figure out how to stop using drugs. They Times when I would stop using drugs and my life would start to improve, and then something when I would lose use drugs again, I would pick up a drug, and I would end up in the same place I started. Sometimes even worse, and so I was tired of that vicious cycle of relapsing and recovering, and relapsing and recovering, and I figured maybe if I go to school, that somehow or another me getting an education will help my self esteem, and I would not have to use drugs again. I didn't have any other greater plan than that. But I enrolled in a local community college in Dade County, in Miami-Dade College. And I enrolled in a paralegal program. And I ended up, you know, graduating at, you know, the top of my class. And my professors encouraged me to continue my education. So I pursued a bachelor's degree in public safety management with a concentration, y'all might like this, in criminal justice, right? And I figured, once again, you know, I'm thinking I'm a smart guy. I'm thinking in my head, man, I got a lot of experience getting arrested. I got a lot of experience preparing before judges and definitely a lot of experience being locked up. And so I believe that somehow those experiences was actually going to help me perform well in this, in my, um, my bachelor's degree uh, classes. And guess what? It did. And I ended up graduating again with highest honors. And eventually I was accepted into law school. And in May of 2014, I ended up graduating with a law degree from FIU College of Law. Y'all can clap now. <clears throat> but let me tell you, I'm gonna go back to those railroad tracks, right? Because, well, you know, I, I used to tell folks sometimes that when I was standing in front of those railroad tracks, right, if somebody would have came to me and say, Desmond, Desmond, don't jump in front of that train. Please, my brother, because in a few years, you're going to get all kinds of degrees and, 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 and you're going to end up graduating law school. Desmond, please don't jump. Don't jump, my brother, because in a few years, you're going to meet the president of the United States, not once, but twice. And you're going to sit on boards with commissioners and mayors and, 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 and state attorneys and judges. Don't jump, my brother. Somebody would have said, Desmond, please, please don't jump. Because in a few short years, man, you're going to be, become the president of an organization that's eventually going to be even nominated for the Nobel Peace Prize. Don't jump. In a few years, you're going to be, Time Magazine is going to tell you that you're one of the 100 most influential people in the world. That you're going to be named the MacArthur genius. Please, my brother, don't jump. And I tell folks that if somebody would have approached me on that day and told me all of those things, you know what I would have done? I would have put them in a the chokehold and they're going to take me to that dope spot so I can get some of that good dope they smoking.
Because there's no way, there was no way that you could convince me that a crackhead that's homeless, that just came out of prison, that got a record a mile long in just a few years would achieve those things. That's impossible. So they had to be on some good stuff. And I wouldn't have let them go until they took me to that spot. But I'm here today in front of you as an example that no matter what the obstacles are that we face in life, no matter the mistakes that we may make that we're ashamed of that cause us to walk around with our heads down or believe that we can only go so far in life because we messed up. No matter what that is, that we can overcome that, right? I remember when I found out that, well, two things. When I, the first time when I found out that I made time 100, right, and I was in the car with my wife, and I was like, baby, what, did, what do they mean by that? You mean I'm like one of the 100 influential in the country? And her response was, nah, baby. They said the world. And when I thought about that, it blew my mind. And the first thing out of my mouth was, baby, there are more than 100 countries in the world. So that means that I was named more influential than a lot of people that were presidents of their own country. That was wild for me. And then, you know, I, I went to the gala in New York, you know, and hanging out with all of the famous folks and everything. And I remember they put me at a table with the people from Time Magazine. And, and I went in on them. I was like, y'all messed up. I'm like, what you talking about? Like, oh, I, didn't, I didn't, matter of fact, I don't even know if I use the word mess, but we're going to keep it clean today. I was like, yeah, y'all messed up. I'm like, what are you talking about? I said, well, for the edition of Time 100, y'all put Dwayne The Rock Johnson on the cover, right? Y'all should have put me on the cover, right? And it wasn't me being conceited, right? Well, maybe a little bit. Right. But it wasn't really me. It wasn't really me being conceited. What it was was and what I explained to them was that if you were to put me on the cover. Right. Then everybody looking at that magazine would know that you don't have to be a movie star. You don't have to be an athlete. You don't have to be a celebrity. You don't have to be a billionaire. You don't even have to be a president of a country to have an impact not only in your community or your state, but in the world. That everyone looking at that magazine cover with Desmond on it would know that if that guy, who used to be hooked on crack, who used to be in and out of prison, who used to be homeless, who used to be jobless, who didn't have anything, if that guy right there could be one of the 100 most influential people in the world, then what does that say about me? That these obstacles that we may be facing, these trials that, may, that we may be having to go through, what does that say to me? What does that say to you? Each and every one of you in this building right now have everything that it takes to surpass even what I've done. That you can become one of the 100 most influential in the world. You can become a MacArthur genius. You can become a nominee for the Nobel Peace Prize. You can become Floridian of the Year. And so many other things that you can impact other people's lives in a very profound way. Each and every one of you has inside you what it takes to do that. Ladies and gentlemen, I submit to you that you are the who. Now let's talk about the why. You know, in Florida, I remember when I found out, and this was many years ago, that Florida was one of four states that permanently disenfranchised people with felony convictions. 
Basically, what it means is that anyone convicted of a felony offense in the state of Florida would lose their civil rights for life. For the rest of your life, which means that you can't vote, you can't sit on the jury, can't run for office, can't own the firearm. Let's go to the sit on the jury because a lot of people discount that. You guys remember the George Zimmerman trial? And you remember the outrage that a lot of people had when he was acquitted? And you know how some people even noted that his jury was basically an all-white jury? Well, that jury was exactly the jury that needed to be set in this county. You know why? Because that jury actually represented the voting demographics of that county. It does. And if people like me have lost the voting rights, right, have lost civil rights, how can I be on the jury? I can't. And so that jury was for, you no know, more or less, an accurate representation. And a lot of people discount that because, but if you think about it, right, if you talk about justice, if you talk about bringing justice to families and being able to have a say in that, right, you have a much louder say in the jury box than on the street corner. You have a much louder say in bringing justice to your community at the ballot box than at the corner. And that's just reality. And so in Florida, a person lost all of that once they were convicted of a felony offense. I know a lot of times when we think of felony offense, we think of somebody that committed murder or done some heinous crimes, but so many people, and I know for a fact, I'm going to be so presumptuous and make my, just be as vulnerable as hell, but I know for a fact that the majority of you all have a family member or friend that's been locked up before. Now, if I were to go maybe to a different type of college, maybe I, couldn't be, I wouldn't be able to say that. But I could definitely say that here. Because of the disproportionate impact that policing in, that we see of, of policing in our communities and the disproportionate impact of people who are convicted of felony offenses tend to look like people like me and you, right? And so I want to take you back because you can't understand the why today if you don't understand the why of yesterday. Y'all with me? So let me take you back. We're going on this journey, right? And I'm going to ask you to switch characters back and forth, right? So you can get a real good understanding. Now, you all can help me out with this. Slavery has been in this country for how many years? Anybody, take a wild guess. 200, 300, 400 years? You know how many generations? We gonna cut it down. I'm, 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 I'm gonna be, take a little easy on folks. Say it's been 300 years. That's three generations. Y'all with me? So for three generations, somebody have been taught to think a certain way, right? To look at us a certain way. Three generations. I want you to imagine for a second, right, that your mama that took you in the kitchen to, to teach you how to cook the family secret gumbo recipe. Right? And that recipe was taught to her by who? Her mama, who was your grandmama. And that recipe was taught to your grandmama by her mama, who's your great great grandmama. And so you've been growing up in your family from the time you was a baby all the way to adulthood, being told that you do things a certain way, and that's the right way, and that's the best way to do it. Your mama done told you. Your grandmama done told you, and your great-grandmama done told you. 
then all of a sudden somebody come up to you and tell you that everything your mama, grandmama, and great-grandmama have told you have been a lie. And that they are bad people and they didn't know what they were talking about. It's a better way to make that gumbo. Would you say, okay, show me how to do it? You're going to naturally resist. Because you've been raised and you've been indoctrinated to believe that my mama ain't telling me nothing wrong. My grandmama ain't telling me. Definitely my grandmama ain't telling me nothing wrong. And I know for, for sure that my great-grandmama is not. So I want you to go back to those three, four hundred years of slavery where you had slave owner upon slave owner rearing their kids and teaching these kids. What are they teaching them? What are they teaching them? They're teaching them that people like me and you are dangerous, are, are less than animals, that it's okay to beat us to the white meat. It's okay to destroy our families. It's okay to rape our mothers and our fathers. It's okay to do it in front of the kids. It's okay to kidnap. It's okay to kill. It's okay to maim. And then when we go to church, we got the preacher in the stand saying, and the Bible said that slaves should love their masters. So it was all justified. So now I switch characters and be that slave owner who've been engaging in all of these things and you go to bed believing everything that your mama, grandmama, and great-grandmother told you and you wake up the next morning and somebody told you that the federal government done flipped the script on us. And now they're saying that those people who you looked at and worse than, treated worse than an animal have just as much rights as you do. What do you think about that? The federal government is now trying to force this craziness down your throat. They telling you that what your mama Grandmama and great-grandmama have been telling you it's all been a lie and that your mama, grandmama, and great-grandmama are evil people? And you're just supposed to accept that? So that was already traumatic. Then to make matters worse, what do you think happened? When the slaves were free, what do you think happened? They took advantage of those rights and guess what they did? They voted. And that became scary as hell. Why? Because after the Emancipation Proclamation, when after the slaves were freed and they started getting engaged and exercising their rights and their political capital, you started seeing former slaves being elected into office. Now you, Mr. And Mrs. Slave Owner, how do you think you felt when that boy who you raped his daddy in front of, who you stripped his mama butt booty naked and beat her until the flesh was hanging off of her bones? That little boy who you sold his sister to someone else so they can rape her was just now elected as sheriff of your county. How do you feel? Well, let me tell y'all a story. I had a nephew. Name was Lil Desmond. I was Big Desmond. A few, a few ages apart. I was a little older. And when we were kids, we used to roughhouse. You know how we are. You know, you playing cowboys and Indians and all kinds of stuff, wrestling and all that. And I remember one particular time, I tied Lil Desmond up on a tree, right? And every time he started crying, I would throw water in his face, right? Of course, some of that water get in his mouth, and he's so, <laughs> you know, he crying and everything. And I remember he was saying, Big Desmond, one of these days, when I get older, you get older, I'm going to get you back. Right? I pay him no mind. I threw some more water in his face, right? I ain't think twice about it. Desmond ended up leaving and going with his dad because his dad was in the Navy. And when he came back a few years later, little Desmond was six foot four, 230 pounds, and I'm looking up at him. 
What do you think is the predominant thing in my mind right now? Boy, I hope he don't remember all that messed up stuff I did to him. Because he had the ups on me now. So I was in fear of retribution. And so when you talk about 300 years of atrocity that was perpetrated on our ancestors, day after day after day after day, the brutality that was perpetrated on our great-grandfathers and mothers. For them to one day be free and all of a sudden exercise their political clout and start getting into office, how do you think that former slave owner is going to feel? He just know it. Because that slave owner, maybe you have a family of five people, but you got 100 slaves on your plantation. They can outvote you. Now they can be in control of you and they're going to remember what you've done to them and they're going to exact retribution. So they thought. Or so they thought. And so what did they do? They engaged. They tried to come up with different things that we've got to do something to diminish this newfound political power. We have to. And not only that, we have to make sure that they don't have the desire to acquire this power. And we want to make sure that it's generational. So what do we do? Well, one of the things we do is, well, do the felon disenfranchisement. We're going to make laws that we know that mainly slaves will do. And we're going to say that those laws will cause you to lose your civil rights for life. So maybe... Oh, you might get mad and hit your wife. We'll make that a disqualifier. We're going to say if you hit your wife, that you cannot ever vote again in this state. But if you kill your wife, which black folks don't do, at least back then they didn't. If you kill your wife, it's okay. You can still vote. You lose your rights for not having a job. You lose your rights for loitering. You lose your rights for stealing the chicken, but not killing somebody. And so we're going to create these laws that we know that the slaves are more likely to do. And when they do it, we're going to capture them, right? And we're going to put them in prison. We're going to, we're going to, we're going to, we're going to convict them and strip them of their rights. And after we put them in prison, you know what we're going to do? We're going to outsource them as prison labor right back into the same fields that they were just liberated from. Problem number one, check. So what about the other ones that we can't get through the criminal system? Well, why don't we institute poll taxes? Because, shoot, they, ain't own, they don't own nothing. They don't have no money. Okay, you want to vote? You've got to pay a certain amount of money to vote. Enough box. Check. But then they, maybe there's some people that ground up a few pennies and was able to pay the full tax. So they said, okay, for them, you have to have a literacy test. Because we know at one time it was illegal to even teach a former slave or slave how to read. So let's do a literacy test. Or let's do how many jelly beans in a jar test. Right? Anything that would discourage them or prevent them from registering the vote. And for those Negroes that have the audacity to overcome those obstacles, right? Our last resort is what? State-sanctioned violence. That means that we're going to hunt these folks down, these uppity Negroes that think that they can beat our system, and we're going to hunt them down with the same people that used to hunt down the runaway slaves. They call it the slave patrol. That has morphed into modern day what? Law enforcement agencies. But we're going to use these slave patrols to hunt these Negroes down and we're going to string them up. We're going to hang them high and we're going to leave their bodies hanging as a symbol to remind those other Negroes that might 
get in their mind that they may want to register to vote, what would happen to them? We're going to burn crosses. We're going to burn their houses down. We're going to shoot right down the street, not too far. And, um, oh, Jesus, my mind just went crazy on me, right? Right down the street, right outside of, of Orlando, Florida, right? How they burnt down the entire town all because people wanted to vote. Not, Rosewood is another one, but it was Okoe Massacre. If you haven't read it, you should read it. Okoe Massacre. In this case, the gentleman paid the fines and fees or the poll taxes, right? Because he had one, one black dude that had a little money and he was paying the taxes for other people who didn't have money so they were able to vote. And for that, they killed hundreds of people and they burned entire community down and chased everybody out of there. Those were the things that was done and it was primarily out of fear of retribution. And today, those same things still exist. You see, because they figured we either going to lock them up, we're going to put obstacles in front of them, we're going to scare them, and we're going to discourage them from wanting to register to vote or even vote. And you know what the final thing was? We're going to create a culture that makes them think that voting ain't even important. Right? Because that's the ultimate thing, getting them to not even want to do it. That way we don't have to work as hard and kill them. We get them to just stay at home. They say, ah, my vote don't count. Ah, it don't matter who get elected. That sound familiar? That sound familiar? So these same tactics, right, are present today. Right? And when you think about our ancestors, our Grandparents, our great grandparents, and cousins, because we got some cousins out there, that in spite of facing almost certain death and brutality, we have the evidence. We've seen the pictures. We got receipts. In spite of facing all of that, they still manage. They still manage to get to the doggone ballot box. That they sacrificed all of that. And you know what? They didn't sacrifice it for them. It's who they sacrificed it for. They sacrificed it for the who. And the who is who? It's us. That people were willing to put their lives and body on the line so that people like you and me could participate in democracy and exercise our power. And we walk around here thinking we don't have any. Or we walk around thinking that the only way that we're going to get what we want is by doing other things. When our ancestors knew what time it was, they knew the power, the power of the vote. They knew it so well that they laid their lives down for us. And one of the geniuses of, of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. was the fact that he also knew that we had to somehow or another alleviate the fear of the slave owner. Let you know, yo, dude, we know you did some bad stuff to us. But I ain't coming to kill you, bro. I just want my fair share. And I just want an opportunity to enjoy the benefits of my hard work for all these years. I don't want to take you out. I don't want to eliminate you. I have a whole bunch of reasons why I shouldn't want to. But what I learned is that I can't get to a better place operating under hate 
or operating under fear. I can attain the highest goals when I operate under the power of love. And the one thing that I know about love, be real with you, it ain't what a lot of people think it is. See, it's easy to say that you love somebody that confers a benefit to you. It's easy to say, oh, I love you because you just broke me off a couple stacks. You know what I'm saying? Oh, it's easy to say, oh, I love you because you took me shopping. And you popping bands for me. It's easy to say, oh, I love you. But one thing I know is that when you talk about love, true love, it's your ability to say, I love you to the person that you despise to the person that may even want to harm you. That's what we've seen our ancestors do. That in spite of what you do to me, because I believe in the higher power, and I believe that hatred can't drive out hatred, fear can't drive out fear, but I believe love Oh, yes, that word love can conquer it all. So in spite of what you do to me, I'm going to love you through this situation. And boy, that sounds so difficult, don't it? I'm talking about to love somebody that want to kill you. But one thing I know, we know how it is in the hood. Somebody shoot somebody, then that somebody, people want to come and shoot back, and then that somebody, people, where they get us? Where does it get us when we respond to hatred with hatred? Where does it get us when we respond to violence with violence? We see it every day in our communities. So we know that's not the way. When people give us mad props, man, let me tell you something. You're going to have other distinguished speakers, but I want you to remember this. Get a little cocky a little bit, right? Y'all ain't going to have now speaker come this year from Florida that made time 100, MacArthur genius, and nominated for the Nobel Peace Prize. And ain't a person living in Florida that can say that. That's from the hood. Mm hmm? That came from leading a campaign and an effort, even still today, that believed that we can accomplish more with love than we can with hate or fear. And we was able to bring people together from all walks of life, all political persuasions, you know, all racial dispositions and political dispositions. We brought them all together to say yes to second chances. Right. We brought them together because each and every one of them had someone that they knew that they loved who made a mistake and deserved a second chance. And they voted for someone who they loved. And we showed the world that love can, in fact, win the day. Show the world something else. Believe it or not, I have seen evidence of this. We had organized along the lines of humanity. We elevated our campaign above partisan politics, we elevated our campaign even above implicit racial biases, right? And we took it to a place that connected each other along the lines of humanity. And I'm going to end with this piece right here, which is so important because I believe deep, deep, deep down inside of our souls that we have a desire to live in a world where we can love our neighbor and I, we know our neighbor loves us and that we, we have a desire to live in a world in which we're safe, we feel safe. That we desire, we have this natural desire to bond with each other along the lines of humanity. I know this because you know when you I always see it? I always see it after a natural disaster. Always. After a calamity, whether it's a hurricane, whether it's a tornado, whether it's the condo collapsing in South Florida, every time there's a calamity, we show our true selves. 
We show it. I know right now that any one of you all, if you're driving down uh, 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 I-95 somewhere and you come across a bad accident and you see someone that's laying on the ground and you or you decide that you want to stop and you get out your car and you run up to that person. I got a thousand dollars right now that says that your first question is not going to be, did you vote for Donald Trump? It ain't even going to be, what's your immigration status? It ain't going to be, what's your sexual identity? It ain't going to be, what's your religious preference? It ain't going to be how much money you make. I'm willing to guarantee you that your first question is going to be something along the lines of, are you okay or how can I help? You see, in moments of calamity, in moments that require us to naturally react, we don't see a person's color, we don't see a person's politics, we don't see a person's sexual preference, and none of that. What we see is another child of God. What we see is another human being, and we respond to that, and we respond to that in such a powerful way that we've oftentimes put our own lives in peril just to save another human being, and we don't even know. So don't tell me that we don't have inside of us what it takes to love our enemies. Don't tell me that we can't overcome that we cannot defeat these forces of evil. Don't tell me that you have to hate another human being in order to advance the cause. Don't tell me that you have to be afraid of another human being in order to advance policy. Because I know deep, 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 deep inside what matters most to us is the humanity that we see in each other. We've just, we've just allowed society to create these labels and divisions. But there's so much division even amongst ourselves that prevent us from achieving great things that lay in wait for us, for you. If we want to create a more just, more equitable, fair society I could listen you've said it so many times how many times you've said it think about it I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands one nation under God, indivisible, and the most important six words, with liberty and justice for all, not some. We know what we want. And if we're going to make those words ring true in our lifetime, in our society, then we have to first realize that we don't have to wait for a superhero. We don't have to wait for a civil rights icon. That the hero lies within who? Us. The us. So we have to figure out who we want to be. Because each and every one of us can be a hero. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Nee, for that wonderful and inspirational message to this group. I invite you all now, if you have any questions, and I encourage you to do so, to step to the mic here and ask them. All right, Ms. Scott. <laughs> Thank you. 
I don't think it's on. It's on now. All right, how are you doing, sir? Uh, greetings, I am O'Neill Daly. I'm a junior accounting scholar from Spanish Town, Jamaica, and I humbly serve as Mr. Junior for the academic school year. Uh, my question to you is, senior struggle, senior story, um, I believe each and every one of us has something that motivates us, right? Um, for me, it's my family. Seeing them struggle, um, it motivates me to do better. So my question to you is what motivates you to really do better? Thank you. I almost said, yeah, man. You know what I mean? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for that question. I was born, I was born in St. Croix, U.S. Virgin Islands. You know, so I can put a little, you know, patois in my voice every now and then. I lost a lot of it. But, no, that's a great question, you know, and it's a real difficult question for me to answer. <clears throat> but let me see if I can tell a brief story. You know, when I crossed the tracks, I did stop after I crossed those tracks, and I looked back. Something made me stop, look back at those tracks, and I asked myself a very simple question. And the question was, Desmond, if you would have died, if the train would have came and killed you, how many people will come to your funeral? And when I thought about it, I'm like, nobody. Ain't nobody coming. I mean, I was homeless. I probably had no idea, nothing like that. And they would have probably buried me in the pauper's grave. And I didn't like that. That gave me an empty feeling. And so I kind of changed the scenario and said, okay, Desmond, the train kills you, but the Miami Herald got your picture on the front page, top of the fold, Big headlines, Desmond killed by train. How many people would come? And I'm going to be honest. I thought long and hard, and I think I only came up with four people. And I had asked myself, you know, that kind of like hit me in the gut, like a Mike Tyson punch, because I asked myself, I'm like, man, you mean to tell me after all these years you've been living on this planet and living all these different places and having friends and girlfriends and all that, you mean to tell me only four people would care if you died? Have your life been that insignificant? And I remember taking that question with me in, in, um, in the drug treatment. And while there, Rosa Parks passed away. And I remember when she passed away, they had her body laying state in the return of the Capitol. And I remember... When I was, I was sitting down in the treatment center in a room by myself watching people pay their last respects. And I seen so many people with, with tears just flowing down their cheek. And <clears throat> something hit me and made me jump up and I started screaming at the television. I was like, that's it. That's it. That's what I want when I die. That's what I want. And my mind had started racing. And I'm like, okay, when I die, I want to have my funeral. Where am I having that? And I'm thinking, I'm thinking that I landed at Joe Robbie Stadium where the Dolphins played, right? I want to have my, my, my dog on funeral at Joe Robbie Stadium. I want the entire stadium to be filled, even seats on the, on the, um, on the field and everything. And, you know, it was, it's ironic that the thing that I was envisioning in my head was something similar to what we've seen for the memorial for Kobe and Gigi Bryant. I was envisioning something like that only in the football stadium. You know, and after I got to that point, I mean, my mind's still racing, and that one question popped in my head. What type of person could command that type of audience? And I was like, man, you got to be an athlete. You got to be a movie star, you know? And, you know, <laughs> I, I thought about the movie star piece, right? But, man, I was disappointed real quick because, you know, especially ladies, you know, if you think about a movie star, one of the first people that pop in your head is, Danzel Washington, right? Now, I know I wasn't that bad looking. Of a, oh, y'all don't think of Danzel? Who don't think Danzel is handsome? Tell me, raise your hand if he's not handsome. All right, I know he's handsome. Right, or oh, maybe maybe that's outdating you. I don't know. Who, who's that male person today? My, oh, that, okay, all right, okay. All right, Michael B. All right, I give y'all that. But back then, it was Danzel Washington, right? And, you know, I thought about Danzel, and I was like, I know I wasn't a, a bad-looking guy, but I didn't think I was Danzel Washington type of handsome. And so that kind of discouraged me. So I, I didn't think I could be an actor. And, you know, I tell people today, man, I was like, man, I slipped on that. Because if I would have thought about Forrest Whitaker, 
right? I know I look better than him. And if he could be an actor, I know I could have a shot. And I think I look better than Wesley Snipes too. Only thing is he got them abs and I don't have, I may have a bare belly. But other than that, you know, I would, I would have thought I had a shot, but I only thought of Denzel Washington or Michael B. Jordan for you uh, young folks. And so the only choice I had was to be an athlete. Um, and you no, know, eventually I'm like, man, nah, I was too old to be that, you know, even though, you know, I mean, I played a little ball in high school and the Dolphins were sorry back then. They probably still could have used me. Looked like I could, I probably could still play for the Jaguars now. You know, they may need a little help on that O-line, you know, but like couldn't be a movie star, couldn't be an athlete. And I got depressed only but for a second because my mind went back to Rosa Parks. And all those people were paying respects because she committed an act. She committed an act that had a positive impact even all the way up to the day. And so I immediately thought that, man, if I could take all of the pain and suffering that, 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 that led me to the railroad tracks and use it in such a way to help other people, right, that one day they'll be able to help other people and so on and so on. And when I die, there's going to be a whole bunch of people in the audience, in, in the stadium that's going to say, man, if it wasn't for Desmond, my life wouldn't be the way it is today. And so, man, I'm sad. I'm going to miss that, brother. Rest in peace, my brother. And so my initial motivation was to fill that stadium up, right? And then I remember before I left treatment, a young brother approached me and he talked to me about something I had said in a meeting that caused him to experience a paradigm shift, that caused him to have a different outlook in life, that caused him to have hope. And I remember as he was telling me that, something erupted inside of me that I would never felt in my life before. I could tell you the day that I was experiencing a joy that I didn't even know existed, but yet I was chasing all my life, right? It was a joy. It was basically a realization of un or, or understanding of what my purpose in life was. Why am I here? Why am I creating? And everything started coming together because I'm looking at nature, and in nature, everything takes a little and gives a little. And so I understood that my purpose in life, right, was that no matter what I didn't have or had or, 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 or what my status was or titles was, none of that, you know, it didn't matter because there was always going to be someone that was worse off than me, which meant that it was always going to be somebody that I could probably inspire, somebody that I can probably help. Then I realized that even the people that's better than me could probably learn something or two from me too, Right. And so I realized that all of the negative things that I experienced in life prepared me, right? All of those things that used to cause me to walk around in shame got me standing up here in front of y'all right now, telling y'all I'm the only brother with them doggone titles or the only person in them titles from the hood in Florida. And they all came from the negative. Mary J. talk about turning a negative into what? A Lauren Hill. Talk about how do you turn a negative into a what? A positive. And the discovery of that was you doing that by taking the negative and having to have an impact, a positive impact in someone else's life. Right? Not your own, but for someone else. And then I realized that, wait a minute. Man, if all that stuff I went through, if I could take all that and change one life, man, I met my quota. I don't need no big funeral. I don't need a big funeral because all of the things I went through was more than worth me having a positive impact on someone's life. Right? And I met my court. And so, you know, I don't need the big funeral anymore, but, man, that thing felt so good. Man, it's nice being nice. Man, it feels good when you could make a difference in someone's life. And so that became my new drug. That, that what pushes me. So that's why every day when I went to bed, I would pray that God would give me the strength, the stamina, the wisdom, the perseverance, right, and the discernment, not for me to have a good thing in life, but for me to be able to do his work. And his work was very simple. His work was very simple, to give back. Every night when I got on my knees and I prayed to become a better Desmond, it was to improve your lives. Believe it or not, 
everyone in here, I prayed for you. And I prayed for you because I loved you. And I loved you without having to even know you. Because I love the humanity. And I see the God in you. And you're my brother. And you're my sister. And I want the world for you. And so that motivates me to get up every day and do something that can make this world a little better place before I die. And as long as I'm doing that, I'm good. I'm good. So thank you so much for that question. Can we do one more question? One more quick question. Come on, who's going? Don't be shy now. Miss Scott told me that y'all was going to be fighting over the mic. Ask these <laughs> questions. That's what she told me. Come on now. Who's scared? <laughs> okay, come on down. Miss Skirt, come on down. Miss Skirt, come on. If you say you're scared, come on. Let me tell you something. Let me tell you how scared I was when I was going out trying to get people to sign petitions for Amendment 4. Y'all want me to tell y'all that story real quick? Um, let me tell you. I was so scared that when I knew I was getting ready, because I drove all over the state. I used to drive over 50,000 miles a year on my car. And when I drove to certain parts of this state, I would stop my car, right? I would stop my car, and I would open my trunk and get something out of my trunk. Anybody want to take a guess what it was? This was in, 19, in 20, 2018, 2019. What is it when I go, especially in maybe rural parts of Florida, what did I get out of my trunk? What? A Bible. <laughs> she said a Bible. What else? Anybody have another guess? Don't say a gun, please. I can't have one. Anyone else? A what? Say it again. No. A tire. <laughs> no. Let me tell you. No, for real. There were some parts of Florida that when I would get ready to drive through it, I would stop my car, go in my trunk, right? Huh? Man, look here. That man right there, I got to get you some type of prize. I'm going to get you a personal autograph book. Make sure you give Miss Scott your name. Let me tell you, exactly, well, almost exactly. You're close enough. I would take out a Donald Trump campaign poster, Make America Great Again. Listen to me now. Y'all listen up. And I will put that in my back seat. So if I ever got stopped, I would drop, because I had tents. I would drop all the windows on my, on my car, right? All the windows. So when that police approached my car, he going to have his gun out. I already know it, right? When he approached my car, the first thing you're going to see is that back seat. And when he see Make America Great Again, he might think that I'm one of those good Negroes, and maybe I can make it home alive. You want to talk about fear? I know about that fear. Hello. We got to fight through it. Thank you for fighting through yours. I am Tiana Austin, a senior psychology scholar, and I serve as queen in 1866. My question is, was, what was one of your biggest regrets? <laughs> so, <laughs> I tell you, probably one of the biggest regrets that I had was not being there as much for my kids when I was going through it. You know, I got four sons and a daughter, and all of them was in the sports, and, you know, they played football, and, you know, I would, you know, I played a little ball or whatever. But a lot of times I was on the road. Um, and I think that that is one of my, my biggest regrets, just not – being more present in their life and being more active, especially around the athletics. Um, but I understand that that was a sacrifice, right? Uh, that had to be made. And here's the whole thing, man. Let me tell you something. You know, you ever heard G-O, G-I-G-O, right? Everyone, y'all with computers know garbage in, garbage out, right? You get in, you get out of things, what you put into things. 
You know, I don't know because y'all kind of young, but we used to have barbecues at the house, right? And you have somebody bring like a pack of Publix donuts or something like that, right? But then they be trying to make about eight, seven plates, you know what I'm saying? Wrapping them up, trying to take them out the house, you know, or the fellas that bring a, a six pack of Miller Light and try to drink, drink up all the Hennessy, you know? Like, hold up, player. Hold up, hold up, you know? It ain't that type of party. You can't come with a six pack and want to drink up all the top flight, top shelf liquor. You know, you want to drink like that or eat like that, you need to bring something to it, right? And that's the thing. A lot of times where we run into problems in life is that we demand a lot out of it, but we're not willing to put nothing in it. We want the good grades, but we don't want to put in the work, right? We want... <laughs> You know how it goes. You want, you want the A's, but you don't want to use the office hours. I'm going to leave y'all with this because I know we late. I'm going to leave y'all with this one little trick. I'm going to tell you, in all of my years of going to school, and I have two associates, a bachelor's, and a Juris Doctorate degree, right? And by the way, I tell folks I have a dual doctorate degree, right? I got a doctor of law and a doctor of the streets, right? So I'm more than qualified. But let me tell you a little secret. I'm going to leave this with y'all. In all of the classes I took, there were only two classes where I didn't get an A. Spanish and chemistry, right? But all those other classes, I got an A. And I got all kinds. When I went to graduation, I had about four honor stoles. I had about six medallions and about 12 honor cords. I was draped, right? I got pictures of it. I got receipts. But I got that. Let me tell you how I got that. Let me tell you this is a trick that you can use. I'm telling you, it'll work. It'll work. So every professor have what they call office hours, right? But a lot of people don't utilize it. Let me tell you what I do. When that professor gave me, give me assignment, immediately after class, I go where I got to go to the library and I start working on that assignment, right? I schedule an office hour and I go to the professor. And I say, hey, professor, listen, I started on this assignment you know, this is what I've done. Tell me what you think. And let me tell you something. Professors can't help themselves, right? They like to take out their pen and start scratching up stuff. Don't get mad. Get glad, right? Because I take that paper and I go home that night and all the things they say correct, I correct and then do a little bit more. You know, they give me a little advice and I come back and say, hey, professor, I made the changes you suggested. What do you think about that, right? And they'll do what? Take out that pen and start, ch -ch -ch -ch, but not as much. Right. By the time I'm done with them. Right. My paper is a week ahead of time. I can put it down. I know I'm getting a why do I know that that professor can't give me nothing less than an a because what you did that paper. You did that paper. You, hey, I followed every advice you gave me. There's no way you can say that this is deserving anything less than an a did that to every last one of my class. I'm trying to try it. Use office hours of your professor, but you got to do some of the work and they're going to work with you. If they see that you're trying, that they're going to bring their intellect into your, into your shop and help you create the best papers that you could possibly do. And you walking out of there with A's, you're done ahead of time. You ain't trying to do no last minute burning midnight out, getting all stressed out because other classes got other things to do. Get your stuff done ahead of time, right? And have it done right. And set that thing aside and laugh at everybody else. Thank y'all. Thank you so much, Mr. Me. On behalf of our president, Dr. Faison and First Lady Faison, we would like to present this token of appreciation to you. This is your takeaway. Oh, okay. I like this. Bang. Hear me growl.
Thank you all very much for coming. This concludes today, tonight's uh, speakers. <laughs>